open it to you? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're just waiting for a few more minutes for more people to join and we'll start at 605. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Master Gardener webinar, Water in Your Garden, Taking Control. We're so glad you've joined us, and we know you will learn a lot tonight. The Master Gardener coordinator for this evening is Jan Frankel. Hi, Jan. Hi, thanks, Serenity, and thank you all for joining us for this webinar on such an incredibly timely topic. I think we're all going to walk away with ideas that we will need to implement right away. First, just wanna draw your attention to two important items on our housekeeping slide. First, if you have a relevant question that you'd like to ask, please use the Q&A feature. We'll answer, live as, we'll answer live as many questions as possible and many, many more directly with a message. For technical assistance, you can use the chat room. Second thing, at the end of the session, we ask you to please stay online. There'll be a link to a survey and completing that survey We'll bring up another link to a handout with lots of great resources that our speaker will be providing. A quick word about who we are. Slide. Slide. Everyone involved in these webinars is a volunteer in the Master Gardener Program of Contra Costa County. The organization's mission is to extend research-based knowledge to residents of Contra Costa County, which includes information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscaping practices, which is a perfect segue to tonight's topic and to our speaker, Lori Palmquist. Slide, please. Lori is an irrigation expert who's designed, installed, repaired, maintained, and upgraded hundreds of irrigation systems in her 33-year career as a landscape professional. She has a fiery devotion to irrigation and water conservation and claims to have irrigation water running through her veins. As a water manager for several homeowner associations and large residential landscapes in the Bay Area, she's been responsible for saving millions of gallons of water from being wasted in the landscape. In the past 14 years, Lori has given hundreds of talks, workshops, and trainings to thousands of landscape professionals and the public. And that's pretty good for someone who used to be terrified of public speaking. 
with us tonight, helping to answer your questions. We also have Master Gardeners Greg Letts and Monica Witt. Greg oversees the watering of what we call our garden in Walnut Creek. And while Lori specializes in landscape plants, Greg and Monica are both very knowledgeable about irrigation of vegetables. We also have Master Gardener Brian Kurz monitoring questions on the YouTube live stream. So if you folks on the YouTube have questions, type them into the chat of the live stream and all of our experts will do their best to respond. Okay, let's go. We'll move on to Lori's talk about taking control of water in your garden. Okay. I just want to make sure that, I, that um, can you see me? <laughs> I can't see me. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Let's talk water. 75% of the earth is water and up to 70% of the adult human body is water. Water knows you, but do you truly know water? After the driest January, February, and March in recorded history in California, the drought restrictions have already started coming down the pike. In the East Bay, we're better off than many other communities around the, the state that are already having their access to outdoor watering seriously limited. But rumor has it that the restrictions could get worse in the coming months. So here's my promise to you. By the end of this talk, you will have a full arsenal of strategies for dealing with water shortage restrictions. You'll learn about steps that can go right, right now, uh, sorry, you'll learn about steps that you can take right now to start hardening off your landscape so that it can take the existing and upcoming restrictions in stride. Here's what we will cover. Talk a little bit about the state of drought in California. And then I'll talk a little bit about the three major overarching principles of conserving water in the landscape. And these, these three principles, actually, if you keep those in mind, those three principles, then you can get really creative as to how to save water in the landscape as, as things start happening and you start seeing, starting to see results using other methods. And the last thing I'll talk about is I'm going to give you seven strategies to reduce water use easily and effectively. So here we go. So there are going to be two handouts that we're going to make available to you after you submit the survey for this, for this webinar. At the end of the webinar, we're going to give you a link and a QR code to go right to the survey, fill out that short survey. It's only about three or four questions. And then when you submit the survey, you will be given the link to these handouts. So really you can, you'll be able to access these handouts this evening after the webinar, which is very cool. All right, and the, the handouts are a, it's, it's in one file, it's two PDFs that are in one file, it's a four page PDF, and it's a resources sheet, a two, page, uh, two pages of resources, and two pages of an irrigation checklist and a listing of the strategies that I'm going to be covering later. Now, California and drought. This is the latest drought report from the drought monitor that is put out by the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And that the drought monitor gives us a profile of an up-to-date profile of drought in the in the state. And 
if you haven't seen this before or you're not familiar with the color coding that they're using here, the way it works is that if there were any white on California, that would be there's no drought in that area. The yellow means abnormally dry. The beige is moderate drought. The orange is severe drought. The red is extreme drought. And the purple is exceptional drought. So as of June 14th, we had 99, is that a nine? I think it's 99% of the state is in, is in moderate drought. We've got 97% of the state is in severe drought. And the, um, let's see, almost 60% is an extreme drought and almost 12% is an exceptional drought. So the long and short of it is, hey, we got drought. So now I'll talk about the overarching principles of landscape water conservation. The first one is to lower the water needs of the landscape. The second is to leverage alternative water sources. And the third is to optimize irrigation. And I'll be, I'll be giving examples and resources for each of these as we go through. First of all, lowering the water needs of the landscape. What we'd like to call the low hanging fruit of lowering the water needs of the landscape is getting rid of that lawn, converting the lawn from a high water use plant material to a low water use plant material will save you, well, low water use plants use about a quarter of the water that high water use plants do. So then that means if you were to convert your lawn to low water use plants, once those plants are established, then you'll be using a quarter of the water that you used to use to keep the lawn happy. Now, it, the major water districts in Contra Costa County are East Bay Mud and Contra Costa Water District. I know that there are a couple of other small water districts in Contra Costa County. And I, I apologize, I don't have the information for those here, but I cover East Bay Mud and Contra Costa Water District. These are screenshots of their lawn conversion rebate programs, and they both have really good ones. So they, they just really want you to pull out that lawn and put in low water plants. Now, what we are suggesting right now, because it's June and we're headed into the hottest time of the year, is that you can get this, get the rebate. I mean, you can start the rebate process and get it going, but then don't plant the new low water plants until the fall. Put them in when Mother Nature can actually establish them rather than putting them in now. And uh, doing that will use so much more water than you really need to. So hopefully in the fall, we'll get a good amount of rainfall from, from Mother Nature and the, that will be able to establish your new plants. So we have a poll now. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So hopefully you're seeing this. Um, uh, my, my buddies in the background of you. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're seeing it. <laughs> the poll is going crazy. Yay. All right. So for you folks on live stream, sorry, we don't have the poll for you. And actually, welcome YouTube live stream people. I see there are 171 people watching on the live stream right now. Welcome. Unfortunately, we don't have a poll for you, but we will share the results with you or I'll, I'll speak the results um, because nobody can see them. I give you just a little bit more to finish doing this. And what the poll is asking is question number one is, do you have a lawn? And I invite you to type into the chat in the live stream to tell us, do you have a lawn? Yes or no? And then the second question is, 
If yes, are you willing to remove it? Okay, yes or no. So please do feel free to type it in the in the live stream. <clears throat> All right. Excellent. I think we're done. It's, well, it's still moving. So I'm going to give it just a few more seconds here da, 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 and share the results with you. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll now and share the results. All right. So the yes, do you have a lawn was a hundred and or fifty-two percent of the of the people in in the Zoom meeting have a lawn, and forty-eight percent do not have a lawn. And then for the second question, if yes, are you willing to remove it? The yes is thirty-nine percent, and no is sixteen percent. And 46% of the people in Zoom said they don't have a lawn. So it looks like it looks like people are really willing to go ahead and lose that lawn. That's fantastic. Take advantage of those rebates. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the poll now. Uh, duh. All right. Hopefully now what, what you guys I think will need to do is to just go ahead and close that window for yourself. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So speaking of removing lawns, we have here we have a screenshot from lawntogarden.org. They have a water savings calculator. And this is so cool. I love this water savings calculator because you can go in there and just put in your zip code and put in the square footages of the area that you want to change, whether you want to change from lawn to low water plants, or you want to see what low to high would be, or medium to high would be, it, it will, it'll tell you how much water you would be saving. And this is just really, really cool. And so I invite you to go there and play around with this, especially those of you who still have a lawn and are willing to, to get rid of it, and you're going to use a rebate program, go ahead and go to lawntogarden.org and check out their water savings calculator. So you can get excited about how much less water you'll be using. But I can tell you for sure that you will, the water requirement that you'll be going to is only a quarter of the water requirement of your lawn. Okay. There are also now the, the, the water districts are now uh, giving rebates for flow meters. And these flow meters are really cool. These, these just came, these just came into being uh, just a few years ago. And I think the first one that I heard about was flume. And this is a flow meter that, that attaches a lot of these attach directly to your water meter that's out on the street, that's monitoring your whole property. And you attach that and it comes with an app. And you can see in real time, not only how much water you're using at any given time, but you can see if no flow is supposed to be happening on your site, on your property, and you see that there's flow happening on your property, then you know that you have a leak somewhere. And I've already talked to a couple of people who have the who have the flow meter hooked onto their their water meter and they found out about leaks that they didn't even know that they had and that really truly is the the low hanging fruit of of water conservation is that so often we have water being wasted in places and we don't even know it's happening, like leaks in the irrigation system underground, leaks in your plumbing underground or in the basement or in the walls. So much is unseen when it comes to our water purveying systems on our property. So this is really great. 
I urge you to take advantage of these rebates. And then another one with, um, so we are on lowering the water needs of the landscape. This, this goes right along with that. And this is a screenshot of a web application that Contra Costa Water District uses for letting, showing people the, the actual plants that are low water plants and drought tolerant plants, but really mainly what one of the takeaways that I'd like you to have from this talk big time is low water plants. I'd like you to really just get that term in your head. Let's get away from drought tolerant. Let's, let's think low water plants. And I'm going to be showing you that count in, in some, uh, the slides coming up that California is a low water state. So you can go on to this web application that is offered freely through Contra Costa Water District's website and um, see photos of these plants and find out what the low water plants are. And um, East Bay Mud has a treasure trove of um of photos and plant lists and all of that as well. So the, the resources are really out there. The, the water districts are such good friends to us in this. They're the ones that, uh, well, they just got so much to offer. So in your spare time, go hang out on East Bay Mud site or Contra Costa Water District site and you will learn a lot. All right. Alternative water sources. So of the overarching principles, the three, the first one was to reduce the water needs of the landscape. And the second one is alternative water sources. And the first one I'd like to tell you about is something that's available only in central Contra Costa County. Now, I, I suspect there are a lot of people on this webinar who are from different parts of California as well. And, but I'm mainly going to be talking about what's available in Contra Costa County. But if you don't live in Contra Costa County, I urge you to seek these things out in your own area. If you live in central Contra Costa County, Central San, the Contra Costa Sanitary District actually offers recycled water fill station. So you take your, your tanks and containers and barrels or whatever, you take them over to the, the fill station, you fill them up and take them back home. Now, if you live in the east part of the county or the west part, there isn't really anything like that available as far as I know right now. But I do know that East Bay Mud is starting to dial in some form of this. So I urge you, if you don't live in the central part of the county, to go on to your water district's website and see and just keep track of that because they will be making recycled water available in some way at some point. Now, recycled water also includes you recycling the water from inside your house, of course. So whether it be saving your warm-up water from the kitchen sink, the bathroom sink, the, the shower, whatever. And this is something that, this is a practice that a lot of us developed during the last drought or even two to three droughts ago. It's, it just seems like the droughts just keep coming on and coming on and coming on. and a lot of us have developed really nice habits in the way of reusing water from the house and saving the warm up water. And whenever I give a talk, I ask people what they do to conserve water. And um, uh, a lot of people already do this. If you don't, I highly urge it. Just fill up the water, the, the bucket and take it out and water plants with it. <clears throat> Another alternative water source is gray water to route your washing machine water out to the landscape instead of sending it into the sewer system. 
And the, the easiest way to do that automatically is to do what they call laundry to landscape, where in California, you don't need a permit to do this. And so it's recommended that you don't use this recycled water for your veggies, but it works really well for, for landscape trees. It works for fruit trees. It works for shrubs. Um, it, yeah, so the, um, the diagram on the left-hand side is, is from the graywateraction.org. And there is just a really, uh, it's a really rich, resource-rich uh, website. And they often have hands-on workshops to show you how to do it. They have YouTube videos that show you how to do it. They have, and once you, once you attend a workshop or watch a video, you really feel like you can do it. All right. Another alternative water source is rainwater harvesting, taking advantage of that free water that falls from the sky. Um, we haven't seen a, a, a lot of that lately, <laughs> this year, hardly any, but um, when the water does come from the sky, just catch capture it and hold it as long as possible. So in this in this um, photo that I'm showing you here, I'm actually showing this, uh, I'm not showing tanks and barrels and cisterns, what I'm showing is the landscape. So what I'm urging is that you shape the landscape or build items into the landscape just by doing contouring and shaping and putting some rocks here and there to hold on to that water that comes from, from the roof, that hits the roof. So you can see that this downspout is, is directed onto a dry creek bed. And a dry creek bed in the winter becomes a, an active creek bed, a real creek bed. And this comes from a publication called California Watershed Approach to Landscape Design. And this publication is just amazing. It's just got so many drool worthy photos in it. And they talk all about the uh, watershed approach to landscaping where we make our site into a watershed and we hold on to that water. Now, this again is from that publication. So then in a watershed, generally when we teach about watersheds, we, we show the water cycle and we show that the water evaporates from the, the big body of water. Let's call it the ocean or the bay. Since we're on the bay, we'll call it the bay. The water evaporates, goes into the air, into um, from a liquid form to a gaseous form, and then it condenses into the clouds and falls back onto the earth as either rain or snow, and then ends up running down or sinking into the ground and running or running down back into a waterway. So then what we want to do when we, if we, just want to hold on to that water that falls from the sky onto our property is that we use our house as that watershed. So the the roof is the mountains, the snowy mountains, and the, the water comes down and it goes into the rain gutters, which are the rivers and streams. And then those rain gutters direct the water into the landscape which is a living sponge and it absorbs the water. So we have, we turn, a, a colleague of mine likes to say, let's turn our watershed site into a water sponge site. And so we make it so that the water stays there and sinks into the ground, into the soil, the living soil and replenishes the aquifers. So this is what we're shooting for in rainwater harvesting is actually harvesting it with the land. And you could certainly harvest it with, with tanks and barrels and cisterns as well. But if you shoot for harvesting it with the land itself, then you may or may not have to supplement with tanks and barrels. And that'll become clear in a few slides down. Oh. It'll become a little more clear here. 
Now, this bar chart is, I'll explain it. I tracked the, now this is for where I live in Richmond, California, in Contra Costa County. I tracked the annual rainfall from 2007 to 2021. So these were the water years. And a water year runs from October 1st to September 30th. So right now we are in the 2021 water year. So what I did was I tracked the rainfall and I plotted it on these blue bars. The, the blue bars represent inches of rainfall in each of these 15 years. And then what I did was I brought in the, that see rainfall is measured in inches and so is plant water requirement. And this is really convenient for us because then we can plot things like this and we can compare the number of inches of rain that falls to the number of inches of water that plants need that they require. So I have plotted on here, the high water, the, the, the red line is the water requirement, the annual water requirement in inches for high water plants. So this is your lawn here. And you can see that in these 15 years in Richmond, there was only one year that we got enough rain to take care of high water plants. Then when, we, then when we look at the orange line, that is moderate water plants. And you can see here that in only one, two, three of these 15 years, did we get enough water to take care of moderate water plants, okay? Now here's where it starts getting interesting. We've got this green line here, and the green line represents the annual water requirement in inches for low water plants. And we can see that in all 15 of these years, even during that last drought, which was really nasty, we got enough water to take care of low water plants. That's why I said earlier, California is a low water state. It truly is. And we, we really only see moderate water plants in maybe the understory in forests, or we see moderate or high water plants in um, near, close to, or in seasonal or, or um, perpetual creeks and rivers and waterways. Otherwise, California, California's plants are very low or low water use. So this purple line is where it gets even more interesting. And this purple line is based on a study done at Texas A&M University, where they found that one inch of mulch spread over a planted area will reduce the water requirement of those plants by 25%, okay? So then now with this purple line, we've got the water requirement of a planted, of low water plants that have at least an inch of mulch on top of them, on top of the soil. So, so that, so then there we can truly see that California is a low water state. Now going on to the next one, this is pretty much the same thing, except this is January through December. Instead of it being a 15 year period, this is a 12 month period. And what I did was I plotted the rainfall in a year and actually the, the rainfall. Oh, what I did was I plotted the rainfall. I got the rainfall, historical rainfall averages from climateusa.com. It's something like that. It's in the it's in the resource sheet. But they they provide historical average rainfall for um well, uh, tons of states and uh, tons of cities and tons of states. So I took that for Concord, California and I plotted the average rainfall in each of these months in inches. 
And then it's the same as the last one where I plotted the water requirement throughout these months for high water plants, moderate is the orange, low is the green, and low with an inch of mulch is the orange. So then if we look at this closely, what I am seeing here is that rainfall, we get plenty of rainfall in, uh, let's start with the when the rain is supposed to start. We get plenty of rainfall for low water plants in October, November, December, January, February, March, April, and uh, a little more than half of the rainfall we need in May for low water plants. So then we've just got these these months right in here, June, July, August, and September. Now this is this is East Bay, okay? If what we were to plot this for other places in California, then the, the it ends up a little different, and especially the further south you go in California, these these bars in April, May, and and October they get quite a bit lower. So I'm talking about the rainfall patterns in the East Bay right now. So what I can see here, if I were to think about providing my landscape with alternative water sources, if I just couldn't use water anymore, if the restrictions tightened up so much that I couldn't just turn on the tap and water my landscape anymore, then I would look at this really closely and I would see that I've got June, July, August, and September that I would need to take care of. So then the challenge is we have all of this water that fell in these other months, just a lot of water has fallen. The challenge is how do we hold on to that water? How do we hold on to that water? Okay. If you want to hold on to water or any other liquid for that matter, what do you do? You get a container. In this in this in this case I took a jar. Get a get a jar, fill it up with water, put the lid on the jar. Okay? So, how do you store water? You put a lid on it. Okay? Well, my friend, mulch is the lid of the landscape. Okay, mulch is the lid of the landscape. So with the mulch, we can hold on to that water as long as possible. This is a demonstration garden that I'm involved with as a master gardener in Contra Costa County. This is the Richmond Dry Demonstration Garden at the Civic Center in on uh, McDonald Avenue, the Richmond Civic Center. And this demonstration garden really proves what I just talked about. When we took over this garden in 2018, it was it had it was already a low water demonstration garden, but it was basically a weed patch. It was in pretty bad shape. So we started renovating it. And there were a lot of low water and native plants in that garden that didn't get irrigated for two and a half years while we were starting to renovate the site. Two and a half years with no supplemental irrigation water. And the plants did just fine. They just said, hey, we're good. So that told us that he, that this is that the we're on to something. Low water plants, they don't need water once they're established. So then here's some eye candy from that garden. This is the uh, photo of the native area of the garden. It's it's um, broken into five different areas. We have the native area, a habitat area, a perennial border, a Mediterranean area, and a succulent area. And lately they've been doing a really nice job of renovating this garden and planting beautiful plants and hopefully 
um, we will be able to demonstrate that you do not need supplemental water once the plants are established if you have a good layer of mulch. Now that mulch is a real key thing here. All right. Another demonstration garden that we have started to experiment with in Contra, Contra Costa County is um, it's called the West County Water Conservation Garden in the El Cerrito Hills. And this site has no water piped in and no electricity, which is really exciting to us because we have a prospect of being able to demonstrate how to how to have, well, hope, s s landscape plants and veggie gardens without water being piped in. There's a tank. This is a hillside here. There's a tank right here, right now, that's, a, I think it's a 1300 gallon tank. So we are going to harvest rainwater with that tank and probably get some more. And they're going to set up a dew collector also. So they're going to collect the dew from the air. And they have started, let me show you this, go going to be experimenting with a system that is a, they call it sub-irrigation. And this, uh, the photo on the right shows a setup from Richmond High School uh, Cuesta Engineering did this and they they developed this method. And basically what it is, is it's repurposing plastic bottles and using them in a, in a, um, uh, to, to, well, the, the, they're in putting the water down there where that is. And then the soil goes above that. And then the plants, the plant's roots in the top, they reach down to the water that's underneath. So you don't water from above. The, the roots go after the, the, con the container of water that's, that's down underneath. And at Richmond High School, they had great success with this. So we are setting up a few beds at the West County Water Conservation Garden to experiment with this method. They've also planted a pollinator garden there and um, have really nice plans. That is not available to the public yet though. So uh, watch our website uh, to see how things progress there. <clears throat> Another demonstration garden that I'm involved with is uh, the Climate Discovery Garden in Walnut Creek. And this is where we are going to demonstrate that with a, a garden of low and native plants that are low water use, low and very low, that once they're established, we're going to hopefully just be able to irrigate them to establish them and then turn off the irrigation. So this is another place that, that we are demonstrating that. And here's the landscape design. We've had a few landscape architects and landscape designers working on this project. And I got the honor of designing the irrigation for this project. And we'll be installing the irrigation next month and we'll be planting the plants in the fall. And hopefully mother nature will establish those for us. Okay, strategies for taking care, control of water use. So we've gone through the overarching, the three overarching principles, which were that, well, we did two of the three. This is the third. The first one was lower the water needs of the landscape. The second one was, was to use alternative water sources. And then the third one is, is to optimize your irrigation. So here are some strategies for taking control of the water. I've got seven strategies here and you can take your pick. Reduce the run times on all irrigation zones by 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever you choose. Spread three inches of mulch on planted areas. Repl replace inefficient sprinkler nozzles with efficient ones. Create monthly irrigation schedules. Perform an irrigation inspection. 
hand water efficiently. And the last one is to water all plants as if they were low water plants, giving extra water to those that complain the loudest. Okay. So then let's go. Here we go. Reducing run times by 10%. Now I know that you can reduce your run times by at least 10%. Um, in California, they are asking us all to reduce our water use by 15%. East Bay Mud has a mandatory 10% reduction in place right now. And Contra Costa Water District has a voluntary 15% reduction in place right now. Now, I can really confidently say that most likely you can just go ahead and go out there to your controller and reduce the run times by 10% at least. Because in my experience with uh, the irrigation consultations that I've done, in my experience, people overwater and they overwater really badly. By usually what I see is by at least double. So unless you're really on it and maybe you have a smart controller, if you're if you have a smart controller, I'm probably not talking about you. But if you don't, chances are you are overwatering your landscape. So you can easily go out there and reduce your run times by at least 10%. Now, since we are headed into the hottest time of year right now, it's going to be July real soon, and we call July peak time. It is the, it's the time of year where it is 100% irrigation. It's the most irrigation that we apply to our gardens and is in July. So now if you have something that I should mention is that if you have native plants that are adapted to summer dry climates, then in all likelihood, those plants don't have that really high water need because it's July. Those plants want to be dormant right now. So it's a matter of determining whether you have plants that are dry climate adapted or dry summer adapted. But for the most part, the other plants that are not dry climate, dry summer adapted, you can lower it. And I would caution you as we go into July to not reduce it by more than 10% right now, because we are going into the hottest time of year. But then after July, the water requirement goes down, down, down. So it will be safe for you to do that. So by 10% for every 10 minutes of runtime that you have on the controller, you can just take away one minute. Okay. Strategy number two, spread three inches of mulch on planted areas. So I already talked about this and mulch has really has multiple benefits. I could do a whole webinar on mulch, uh, but mulch has really multiple benefits. But when I'm talking here about mulch, I'm talking about it holding in the water for the landscape, holding on to the water. Now mulch also, has um, soil temperature ramifications. Uh, let me just pull this up here. Da, da, da. So these three photos came from Greg Letts, who is in the background answering questions here on Zoom. And he, he, he sent me these three photos. And he, he provided these photos of soil temperature tests he conducted at our garden in Walnut Creek um, when the temperature was 88 degrees. So it was an 88 degree day. And what he found in checking several beds with an infrared thermometer was that the straw surface varied from 99 to 118 degrees. Bare ground reached as high as 132 degrees. So keep in mind that the that at 140 degrees, the soil microbes, the, the, the organisms in the soil are being killed off at 140 degrees. But the soil under the mulched areas was a consistent 74 to 76 degrees. 
And so what, what Greg says, summing that up, is that maintaining that consistent temperature also makes it easier to maintain a consistent moisture level. This is particularly valuable for the growth and development of many vegetables and to ward off diseases. Okay, thank you, Greg, for those photos. One of the many, many benefits of mulch. Now, when I talk about mulch, really mulch, put the mulch in contact with the soil, okay? Don't put weed cloth down first or landscape fabric or weed cloth and then the mulch. There are lots of problems that end up happening with weed cloth and then mulch on top of that. Or even if you, yeah, whatever you put on top of that, mulch, gravel, whatever. The, the mulch needs to be in direct contact with the soil. Now, this is, um, these photos are, are from a, um, uh, one of my neighbors, the, the house changed hands. And so they staged the backyard and they, they pulled everything out and laid down the weed cloth and then ran the blank irrigation tubing and cut a hole in there and put the plants in and ran the blank irrigation tubing and one or two emitters to each of the plants. And then the, the photo on the right is less than three years later, the, the, the garden plants were doing terribly and the, um, there were weeds all over the place. So it might have well, the weed cloth might as well not have been there. So what ends up happening with weed cloth is that even if they say that this weed cloth lets air and water through, it's got the biggest holes and it lets air and water through, those holes do get silted up over time. Those holes will get clogged by the minerals in the soil over time, and they will become impermeable to air and water. So then the soil microbes will either go dormant or die. So this is, this is a way that you not only kill off soil mic microbes or, or cause them to grow, go dormant, but the plants do terribly. When I get calls to come out and do consultations, because people say my plants are dying and they think it's because of the irrigation. When I get there and I see these suffering plants, the first question I ask is, do you have weed cloth under that mulch? Is there landscape fabric under that mulch? And more often than not, there is. And that's why the plants are suffering so much. So, I we recommend very strongly that you put mulch on top of your soil and have that mulch be in direct contact with the soil. That way you really nurture the soil microbes and you nurture the plants to the best of your ability. Okay. Strategy number three is to hand water efficiently. So there are two questions that you need to answer when you're going to hand water. Now, if the restrictions become so strong and so tight that they tell you, you get this much water uh, a day or a month, usually it's this much water a day. When I see restrictions like that happening, they, they say, you get this much water a day. So if it comes down to that, you really need to know how much water not only how much water the plants need, but how much water you're giving the plant when you're standing there with that hose end sprayer, that nozzle, and you're actually watering the plants. So how do you answer those two questions? The first question, how much water do the plants need? In this resources handout, I have a, a link to a web application that will tell you how much, how many gallons a day, a week, a month, a year, whatever, how many gallons any plant need plants need in any incorporated city in California. So you can use that web application to answer that first question, how much water do the plants need? And then the second question, how much water is being applied? 
you could use a hose end flow meter. Now, these hose end flow meters just came on, they flooded the market uh, just a, few, a couple of years ago. Before that, they were hardly even existent, or if they were, they were really expensive. So you can get this hose end flow meter and it'll tell you exactly how much water you're putting out at any given time. So that, and there, there are so many of them on the market and they're priced anywhere from 11 to $300. Actually, I've seen some that are almost $400 as well. All right. So in the absence of having a hose end water meter or flow meter, what you can do is you can take a bucket and I'm not calling this a five gallon bucket because those things that we call five gallon buckets are not five gallons, they're 6.2 gallons. So I don't recommend that you use the bucket to measure the water because uh, it's knowing now that it's 6.2 gallons, it's hard to measure water with these buckets. So here's what you do to know how much water, the rate that the water's coming out of that nozzle that you're using. Whoops. I went the wrong way. Number one, you flow water into the bucket for 30 seconds. You stop and you measure the amount of water. I would pour that water into another container that has really reliable uh, measure measurements on it. Then you multiply by two, and this will tell you how many gallons per minute that spray nozzle is applying the water. So then, for instance, if you figure out that that spray nozzle is putting out water at a rate of three gallons a minute, and you find out that that street tree needs 15 gallons a week, then you know that you're going to need to stand there and apply the water for five minutes to get it the, the water that it needs. All right, strategy number four, replace inefficient sprinkler nozzles with efficient ones. Now here, this is one of the low hanging fruits of water efficiency, because we have on this lower, this lower row, we have inefficient sprinkler nozzles. We have fixed spray, we have brass sprinklers, and we have impact sprinklers. Now the fixed spray, it's considered inefficient because it applies water so rapidly at such a high fast rate that the soil, our clay soils or clay loam soils don't have a prayer of infiltrating or absorbing that water before it runs off. So we want to replace that with sprinklers that apply water at a much lower, slower rate. Brass sprinklers, these things are just bad. If you've got brass sprinklers, I recommend that you just pull them out and put in, put in pop-up sprinklers or better yet, put in drip. The brass sprinklers only pop up about an inch and we don't have any plant material, not much, that is less than an inch tall. So they're always spraying right into the plant material. Very inefficient. Impact sprinklers are considered inefficient as well. And then in the top row, we have the first two are rotary nozzles, generically known as rotary nozzles. And you can retrofit those directly into your old fixed spray sprinklers, most likely. And then we have our single stream rotor. Those are for the long range, the long range sprinklers. And those are really efficient when they are nozzled correctly. Now, uh, this is a screenshot from a video that we did during the last drought. We created a website called beyondthedrought.com. And there are nine videos on that website that show you how to manage your landscape during a drought. So I invite you to go to beyondthedrought.com and check it out. And this is a screenshot from the video where we talk about changing out inefficient nozzles for efficient ones. All right, strategy number five is to adjust the irrigation schedule monthly. And uh, so, so this shows the, the standard irrigation scheduling practices that are out there. What people tend to do, so the red bars represent an irrigation schedule. And the blue bars represent the actual, the water need of the plants for, um, during these months. And so what happens is that a lot of people, what they do is they put in that July schedule 
that hotter than Hades schedule. And they end up leaving that hot schedule all the way through August, through September, and all the way through October. And then once it starts raining, they just turn the controller off. Well, but in the meantime, the plant water requirement from July to August is going down from six inches to five inches. And then in September, less than four inches. And in October, just a little over two inches. So the water requirement is going down, down, down in those three months after July, but the amount of water being applied is staying the same. And the way that people say the reason for doing this is that, hey, we've got 100 degree temperatures in August, September, and October. But even though there are 100 degree temperatures, the days are so much shorter. They're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. The sun is on a lower trajectory in the sky, and the plant water requirement is reflecting that. So you're wasting a lot of water if you don't adjust that schedule monthly. So that's what we recommend is monthly. And so here for Contra Costa County, what I've done is now smart controllers do this automatically. Okay. So again, if you have a smart controller, I'm not really talking to you because your controller is already doing this. But if you have a standard controller and you're creating the irrigation schedule, then I've broken Contra Costa County down into three climatic areas, east, west, and central. And I have the percentages of adjustment for each of those months. Now, July is 100% and everything else is less than 100%. So most modern irrigation controllers have what we call a seasonal adjust function or feature. Now, I want you to adjust monthly, not seasonally, because we saw in the previous slide what can happen within a season. You can waste a lot of water by just adjusting seasonally. We want you to adjust monthly. So these are the, the adjustments that you would put into that controller if it has the seasonal adjust feature. So you put in a peak schedule, that 100% schedule, and then with the seasonal adjust, it lowers the runtime based on the, the percentage that you programmed in. All right, strategy number six is perform an irrigation inspection. And this inspection is, this is the one of the handouts that I have for you. And again, it's a four page handout. It's actually two handouts that have been aggregated into one file, one PDF file. And this uh, irrigation checklist will guide you through what to look for in your sprinklers and your drip and tell you what to do about it if you find problems. And then it also lists on the back side, next page after this page, it lists these seven strategies and has a bunch of other notes and recommendations for conserving water in your landscape. So inspecting the irrigation, you just turn on each zone one at a time and you walk around and you look and you listen. With sprinklers, you can look, you'll see the problems, you can see tilted sprinkler heads, you can see sunken sprinkler heads, you can see nozzles that are facing the wrong way. Um, so you can see the problems that you're having with the sprinklers generally. And then with drip, if you've installed it correctly and you put it on top of the soil and mulch on top of that, you have to listen for the problems for the drip. You have listened for leaks, breaks, spouters, even kinks. Kinks have a certain sound. You can hear a kink in a drip tube. So that is about the irrigation, inspecting the irrigation. And then last but not least, strategy, not least, I say, because I love this one. I just love this one. Water all of your plants as if they were low water plants. Okay? Water everything as if it were low water plants. And then just go out there and hand water, give some extra water to those plants that complain the loudest about this low water schedule. Now, you might be asking, what's a low water schedule? How do I know that I'm putting in a schedule for low water plants? Well, 
And and I just I have this photo here because it's an example of what most people's gardens have, which is mixed low and moderate water plants. And in this mixed area, we had the irrigation schedule has to be for a moderate schedule to take care of that higher water use plant. And the low water plants are getting too much water. So then because we're in a drought and because we want to save water, we're going to turn that on its head and we're going to do the opposite. We're going to water this as a low water plant um, zone. So then you, you'll ask, how do I know how to program in a low water schedule? Now, I show my resource sheet here again, because on that resource sheet, I, I point you to two free web applications that you can use to create irrigation schedules, correct irrigation schedules for your landscape. Either one of those web applications will have you creating, it's, they're very user-friendly, and you just say, zone one, low water plants. Zone two, low water plants. Zone three, low water plants. And it will give, they will both give you an irrigation schedule to program into your controller. So that's how you can know how to do that. And I, I just love this one because especially if you put in a correct low water schedule for each of the zones, because you will see a huge water savings here. I guarantee it. You'll see a huge water savings. All right. So then, so who can help you with water efficiency? Professional irrigation stores in my resources handout, I list six or seven of them in Contra Costa County. We're really blessed in our county to have a whole bunch of professional irrigation stores. The water districts, treasure troves of resources and tips and tricks and rebates just hang out there. <laughs> They're wonderful. And then I always like to mention Stop Waste as stopwaste.org, the website. They have workshops, they have resources, they show you how to sheet mulch. There is just a, a really wonderful, valuable resource. Now it's in Alameda County. It's not in Contra Costa County, but it is so good. It has to be mentioned. All right. So we are there. <laughs> All right. Well, you know how important it is to reduce water in use in the landscape. And you know there are other choices than the standard turn on the tap sources for water for the landscape. And you have a choice now of seven fairly simple strategies to lowering water use in the landscape. So I hope you're ready to take action. The really cool thing about these strategies is that number one, you'll lower your water bills. Number two, your plants will be healthier. And number three, you'll be able to comply with any drought restrictions that come down the pike in this very dry year. So everybody wins and it doesn't get any better than that. All right, that is it for me. Over to you, Jan. Are you there, Jan? Calling all Jans. Hang on. Now I am. <laughs> now I'm here. All right, Lori, that was great. Thank you. So well informed. We have all these great ideas that we can actually really use. Um, while everyone adds, if you have any final questions, you can add them. And meanwhile, I'm going to remind you of the many ways that you can stay connected with the Master Gardener program uh, besides these webinars. Slide. First, the UC Master Gardener website, which is basically a gateway to all kinds of information. Lots of it, Lori actually referred to tonight, but there's lots more. That's available anytime. You can also find us on all the major social media channels. And you may not be aware of our help desk, um, but if you live in Contra Costa County, 
You can get personalized help by emailing your own questions to our experts. And if you don't live in Contra Costa County, most likely there is a Master Gardener program in your county, um, which you can look into and, and do pretty much the same thing. Slide. And here it is. You can get to the survey that we've been referring to. You can get the handout that we've been referring to. Um, this QR code on the screen, there'll be a link also in the chat section uh, on your screen. Um, it's, it's pretty quick. And uh, my understanding is it's new and improved and you can get an instant handout <laughs> when you complete the survey. <laughs> you can switch sides. Okay. I kind of want to give a minute to do it. Okay, so just a heads up, you're actually going to receive another survey, um, I believe via email. It'll be a follow-up, not from us, from the UC office, and it's brief, and it's voluntary, and its purpose is to get feedback to better serve the community, which is all of you, all of us, um, and to improve our program. So if you can get to that when you see it in about three months, <laughs> we would really appreciate your feedback. Slide. All right. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of questions and tried to put them in some uh, categories here. Uh, all right, let's see. Whoops. Somebody asked for the, the QR again. Sorry okay. about that. Um, I, I'm just going to have the QR up here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So Great. go ahead instead of the question slide. Great. All right. I'm going to start by saying lots and lots of people have asked a question about fire safe uh, mulches and about mulching close to the house and that sort of thing. And we will make sure to get um, a resource resources for that on the handout if they're not already there. Um, people are already working on that for you guys. So we're not ignoring you. It's just that it's been asked so many times that we, we need to get a resource out there for that. Um, yeah, and 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 Jan, I, I actually didn't include any firescaping stuff in my resources or my in, in either of my handouts, but we do have resources like that available. Okay. Oh, that's right. I forgot it was going to be instant gratification tonight with the right, handout. Right, exactly. <laughs> I thought we had two weeks to add some stuff to it. Okay, so we will we will um, get some responses out on that. Since, uh, okay, a uh, question about uh, irrigation, a few questions about irrigation. You know, you mentioned smart controllers, but a few people have asked, what exactly is a smart controller? And is there one in particular that you recommend? <laughs> All right. So what a smart controller is, is that it's a controller that actually responds to real time weather and adjusts itself. So you, once you program it, supposedly, well, once you program it, it's not a set it and forget it type of thing. So you program it and then you watch how the landscape responds to what you put into this controller. And then you can tweak here and there, a little here and there. But once it's dialed in and everything is happy with that, with that controller, then it adjusts everything on its own automatically every day of the year. It creates an irrigation schedule for every zone every day. So it, uh, they are super, super sweet. I love smart controllers. I've seen them when I've, in, I've installed uh, close to 60 of them, I think, and I still monitor several of them. And I've seen a wa instant water savings of anywhere from 46 to 78 percent. Um, yes, and those numbers are accurate. I am what they call a counter. I count everything. <laughs> I count my stairs every time I go up and down them. I'm OCD about counting. So when I spout out numbers, you better believe they're accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, another question that came up quite a bit is about the expression, once your plans are established. Ah. Um, what does that mean? How do you know when they're established? Is it different for citrus versus other plants? Beautiful. I love that question. Thank you. Whoever asked that, I love you. Well, people. <laughs> so established. When plants, this is based on the research that has been going on since about 2006, I believe, at UC Davis, and it is their plant irrigation trials. And what they have come up with out of those trials is they say quite emphatically 
that plants are all plants. When you put them in the ground, they are high water use plants until they are established. And they say that establishment for most plants is about three strong growing seasons. So I like to say at least a year to a year and a half. And they say that it can take up to five years for a tree to get established. So then the big distinction is that plants are high water use things until they're established. And establishment means that the roots are heading out into the native soil. They're no longer just kind of wound up inside that, that cushy potting soil that they came in. So they have wandered out into the native soil. That's when they are established is when the, the roots are out. And now, because a, a low water plant, you plant a lavender tomorrow, that's not a low water plant until it's established. It's a high water plant until it's established. So if you subscribe to the findings of that irrigation, uh, that research that's ongoing at UC Davis, then that is what it is. Okay. So that's, that's what I mean by that. And I, I urge you to just Google it, UC Davis plant irrigation trials, and they have a whole website develop, um, de devoted to it. So do, does the website or any resource provide something conclusive, like a list of plants and how long they take, or you actually need to go oh, into the soil yeah. and check it out? Yeah, absolutely. So it's not like um, it, it's not like this plant takes a year and this plant takes a year and a half and that plant takes, oh, 18 months. It, it's not like that. What they say is that it takes three strong growing season for all plants, except for trees take three to five years. Okay. And they do have a listing of the plants that they have there. And because they subject those plants to different amounts of water, a normal amount, a less amount, and an even less amount. And people come through once a year and <laughs> assess how those plants look. It is just that these this research is really awesome. And they they tell you what those plants are. The the they give you the lists. Quick backpedal to the controller question. Um, some more questions are coming in about. Are there specific smart controllers you recommend or just where to get more information? On more information on smart controllers? Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, I can tell you that on if you live in either Dublin, Pleasanton, or Livermore or San Ramon. I'm going to be giving a webinar for Zone Seven Water Water District on July fourteenth. On July fourteenth for a Zone Seven Water Water District, and but we urge that you live in one of those four cities to watch that webinar live. Then afterwards, they're going to be putting the recording of that webinar onto their, their YouTube channel. So if you don't live in one of those four cities, I recommend that you wait until after July 14th and check out the recording of that video. I'm going to go, it's an hour and a half uh, webinar where I'm only going to be talking about smart controllers and it should be a good one. Mm. That sounds great. Um, you know, going all the way back to the beginning of the presentation, uh, when you're talking about lawns and lawn replacement, there were some questions on that that came in earlier. Um, a lot of questions about Kurapia, or Kurapia, K-U-R-A-P-I-A, -A, whether that's a good lawn replacement, what the yeah. pros and cons might be, and what is a good alternative that's friendly for bare feet? Is there anything you can put instead of a lawn oh. that you can run around on comfortably? Right, right. Um, Bare feet. Well, if you mow the carapia, it would be fine because then you keep it from flowering and you keep the bees from coming. If you don't mow the carapia, it's not a good one for bare feet. But when it's mowed, it's fine, absolutely fine for bare feet. Um, uh, let's see. So there's also Diamondia and a couple of other things. There were in the, the, the Contra Costa County Master Gardeners had a big conversation on carapia and other 
lawn replacement plants just uh, just this past week in on our um, in our Google group. And what what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask somebody to aggregate that whole conversation. People had photos, they had personal experience. It was awesome. So what we'll do is we'll aggregate that into um, some kind of article to put either on our blog uh, or probably on our blog and also in our next newsletter. Hey, Lori, this is Greg. Let me just say that yeah. uh, there is a turf alternatives talk coming up at our garden in the fall. Oh, excellent. Oh, wow. Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. So go go to our website to get, do you have the date of that, Greg? By I then? don't. I, I think it's October, but it, you know, it's on the website. So yeah, it's on our website. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. I forgot about that. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, so another hot topic um, is mulch, and I certainly can't ask you all the questions that have come in. Um, I'm not sure if we have a, a webinar specifically addressing mulch. I'll ask a few of the questions, um, but I guess that seems to be, what's the word, the easiest alternative, the easiest <laughs> strategy to apply, so we can all do that first, right? So there was a question about the color of mulch that, you know, a lot of people use black mulch. Does it matter what color? Does that keep the ground hotter? Is it less cooling than other colors or is there an ideal right. color? Um, right. I've heard that the dye doesn't matter, but um, you know, uh, uh, one way that I kind of propose that we handle the, the mulch question, Jan, is <laughs> that maybe we ask um, Greg just to say a few words about it and maybe Monica also, because they, They've, they've seen all these questions come through and they may be able to do kind of like a summary, mm -hmm. kind of little summary something. Um, would that so, be okay? Sure. Well, what I've told folks is it, it really kind of depends on your criteria. You know, so some people want a certain appearance and so they may want black versus brown versus tan wood chips. Um, it may be in an area where you want to feed the soil and a great way to go is arborist wood chips on that. And they're usually free. If you can find a tree trimmer that's, we'll give them to you. Um, so it, it kind of depends on your criteria. Good answer. Monica, do you have anything? <clears throat> I have been Thanks. sending out links to uh, two terrific uh, resources on uh, different types of mulch. So I've sent that to many people tonight during this webinar, and we can maybe add it to your resource list, Lori. That might be one way that we can handle it. They're describing lots of different types of mulch and when they're appropriate. Yeah, well, the resource list is already in place. So uh, I can put it in the chat right now. Oh, excellent. Beautiful. Please do. Um, another question about uh, equipment, hose meters, which you mentioned a little bit. The, the question is whether it makes a difference if you get a pricey one or just any old cheap one. <laughs> Yeah, well, what I what I always tell people, and with respect to that, things like hose end meters and moisture, um, the the moisture sensors that that you get, is that if you get the cheap ones, get a bunch of them, <laughs> because they're probably going to break pretty quickly. So what I like to do in things like that is I like to go middle of the road. And I said with those, with the uh, um, Monica, can you mute yourself? We hear you typing. <laughs> Uh, with the with the hose and meters, if you I would say if you go over a hundred dollars, you'll probably be doing really well. Okay. If you get closer to a hundred than eleven. <laughs> okay, this is a good question that came in. It's kind of specific, but I think most people who've you know taken out lawn probably have been in the same position. What should I do about water needs of mature trees? that are in or around current lawn areas that we're transforming to a low water landscape um, via the rebate program. So those trees still need the water yeah. is what the question is getting at. Yeah, yeah. So you can, you can do an emergency 
Um, this is something that we've been talking about a lot lately, especially because the state of California is banning the irrigation of turf on commercial sites. So, and that includes HOAs, but they are they are not banning the the watering of the trees in those lawns. So, what we're talking about a lot now is how to set up an emergency tree watering ring or spiral. And um, let's see, so I need to have a resource available. I, I, wrote a, I wrote an article for our News to Grow By, our newsletter last year about that, the tree spirals. Um, but that might be a little hard to get to. I don't know, do, um, Monica or Greg, do you have any recommendations as to where people can find information on those fairly quickly? Uh, I'm sorry, Lori, I was typing. What, what was the too. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. It's it. Emergency tree watering. Um, um. Uh, so something, the, the, something that I have recommended too is that people just get a soaker hose and run it from the from the hose bib and run that in a spiral around the tree. And you start about uh, three quarters of the way out from the from the trunk to the end of the canopy. So you don't start at the trunk. You 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 start way out three quarters of the way out to the edge of, of the canopy. So yeah, go ahead, Monica. The tree will have to be sort of trained to receive less water. It has been in the habit of receiving water from that lawn, the irrigation that's going to the lawn for perhaps many years. Yeah. And it uh, certainly if you stop it all, of, all at once, it's going to definitely stress the tree. And it, uh, it, it's going to depend on the particular situation, on how much water that soil is holding, whether on the on the slope of the soil that's there, there are a lot of different uh, things that will be uh, important for any given situation. And uh, in any case, definitely it will have to be a slow training of the tree to receive a little bit less water on a frequent basis. So be careful. I'm 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 advising caution. Yeah. So Monica, can you can you address if if there large trees say for instance the couple of redwood trees that are in my backyard they're they're not getting water from the little bit of sprinkling that i'm doing do you think um even redwood trees have a large number of roots close to the surface within the top two feet of soil mm -hmm. so the amount that you're applying may not be nearly enough and they're also uh, drawing water from much deeper but but yes, they are getting some from the little bit that you're applying. Yeah, and what I like to tell people too is that uh, most likely your neighbors are watering your redwoods because well, those- that's what, I, that's what I say is the leak in my neighbor's pool is actually water in my redwoods. Ah. <laughs> yeah, because those roots for the redwoods go way out. They say that the roots in any tree can go up to out up to one and a half times the height of the tree. So that's that's a lot. The roots can go out really far. Okay, well, we're out of time. There's questions, we're busy typing away, but it is time to end the webinar. Thanks again, Lori, Greg, Monica and Brian, and many thanks to Serenity and the library staff for hosting us. Yay. And uh, everyone else get that survey done and you'll get the, uh, You'll get the handout and I believe at some point you'll get a link to the recording of this session. A lot of people have asked that and I do believe that that will at some point be sent out. Oh, can I butt in? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there is a live stream going on on YouTube at the same time here. It's a simulcast. Oh. So that YouTube recording is already up and it'll stay up until I replace it with the recording of this Zoom meeting. So they can access the recording as soon as this evening. Great. Okay. Well, thank and you all for joining and have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, CC Library. Thanks, Serenity and Ava. Thank you. Have a great evening.